The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Amen. Haven't you heard? Seems like the perfect way to start out a juicy piece of gossip. One friend calls another. Haven't you heard? Well, no, of course not. Do tell. Two hours later, these two friends finish with their conversation, getting ready to call the next person and say, Haven't you heard? Well, that's not at all what Isaiah has in mind today, is it? No, in fact, as Isaiah says, Do you not know? Haven't you heard? It seems almost like he's exasperated with the people of God. Here he is, Isaiah chapter 40, so we know this is after they've been returned from Babylon, from the exile. And so they've seen the great power of God. Again, he details it for them. With his first question, haven't you heard? All of a sudden he goes through the power of God, the might of God. Did you notice that in in verses 21 through 28? He listed the strengths that God had, the way that he had worked for them. And in case they didn't get it, again, he repeats himself. Haven't you heard? Did you not know? And he shows them that God is not only a mighty God, but he is a God of love and a God of strength. He is a God who gives them strength when they are weak. For even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and shall not faint. Isn't that exactly how our text ended for today? Exactly what, they, what the people needed to hear. But he seems exasperated. Almost as if they should know this already. That this should be something that is not only something they've heard, but that they've experienced in, this, in their lives. That they shouldn't have any excuse whatsoever to say, well, no. Now, don't we ask that same question, though, sometimes? With the same amount of exasperation. Well, haven't you heard? Haven't you heard about Jesus? Have you ever asked that question? Wondering how someone could still, in this world, in this day and age, still say they have not heard of Jesus. Haven't you wondered to yourself, with all the technology we have, how someone can still say, no, I haven't heard. And I'm not talking about those people who reject the gospel. I'm not talking about the people who have heard and said no. I'm talking about people who have not heard at all. I know that I have wondered before. I've wondered how, we, when we've sent missionaries to every corner of the world, it seems, to Africa, to South America, to Russia, to China, to Korea, how there's still people who haven't heard the good news. Aren't these, aren't these missionaries sharing that message? Aren't these missionaries going out and proclaiming the gospel? So how haven't they heard? Or maybe the question isn't how, but maybe it's why. Why haven't these people heard yet? Why haven't they heard the good news? Well, we know it's not because Jesus doesn't want them to hear it. We know that God sent His own Son so that there would be the sure promise, so that we would have no question in our mind. We know that He not only sent sent Jesus into the world to bring the promised salvation on the cross, but to teach and ensure that it would continue on. In Paul's words to the young pastor Timothy, he said, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Who wants all men, all women, all children to be saved. So it is God's desire that all people be saved. It is God's desire that all people hear the gospel. So then we have to ask why. Well, there are some people who answer this question with their belief that God just did not intend for people to be saved. He elected some people to be saved, and he elected some people not to be saved before the foundation of the world. Now, this doesn't sound like our God at all, does it? This does not sound like the nature of our God, the God of Scripture. And this is actually counter to the words of Scripture. Because in the words of Scripture, we're reassured that every person has been given a place. And not just as a last minute fix to a problem. But God, before the foundation of the world, He had already put together our plan. And it's one. Having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity, conformity with the purpose of His will in order that we, 
who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. See, Paul uses a word there that we sometimes struggle with, that word predestined. So we often use the word elected instead. We predestined that God has already placed our names on the list for salvation. That he has placed every person's name on that pl- in his plan for salvation. So then why? Why are there still people who are not saved? If God's plan for salvation is for all people to be saved, why are there still people who do not know that promise? Why are there still people who can still say they haven't heard? Why can we still say, haven't you heard? Well, I don't think we really like the answer to the question very much. And I think that's why we tend to avoid the answer to the question. I think that's why we oftentimes try to bury it and forget about it. Because we know that God's plan is for His people to share the Gospel. We know that God's plan is for each of us to have an active role in sharing the promise of salvation. We know that in Matthew chapter 28, God gave us the Great Commission. But we prefer a plan of non-interference instead. We prefer a plan that keeps us just out of reach. A plan that involves us maybe giving to support a mission. Maybe standing back but, and talking about Christ, but never sharing Christ. That plan of non-interference is, is, is infiltrated every area of the church. Every place of the church. Because we, we figured out how we can reason away our responsibility, our opportunity to share that good news. We figured out that if we just say, well, I don't have the gifts or abilities, I don't have the talents or the strength, then I can't be the one. Or we reason that, well, what's good for me is good for me. What's good for you is good for you. But let us not step over the line. And perhaps in your own lives you can think of reasons that you've named. Perhaps in your own lives you can think of times when you have said, well, this is why I can't. You can think of times that you, as you think through your life where that list grows longer and longer. Why I can't share the gospel. I'm too young. I'm too old. I don't have the words to say. Well, I don't know any non-Christians. All my friends, they've heard it before. What is your excuse? What is your reason? How do you Answer that great commission. Jesus says in that Matthew 28, He uses three imperatives right in a row. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go, make, and baptize. We're not commanded to sit to give, and to think. We're commanded to go make and baptize. To be the front line sharing the gospel message. To be the ones sharing the hope to a generation that is hopeless. We are the ones as God's people who have been called and given the greatest news of all. The greatest message to share. And we know that it is a great message. Because we at one time needed to hear it. We at one time, every time, every day need to hear it. That forgiveness that Christ has promised to us. Each and every day, we need to hear that promise of salvation, that promise of hope that Scripture gives to us that was made perfect on the cross. And so we know that need for the people who don't know Christ. We know that need that people have who haven't heard. We know. That when we ask the question, haven't you heard? And someone says no. That they need to hear the voice of Jesus as we did. Saying to them, you are my own. I forgive you. Because it was those words of forgiveness that we heard. That brought us into the church. That brought us into that relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It was that work of the Holy Spirit. Working on our sin-deadened hearts. To make us alive. To make us living children of God. Through the work 
the work that we are called to do. It's not a work of, well, one that we should do grudgingly. It's not a work that we should take on lightly. It's a work that is an opportunity. It's an invitation by our God to take part in taking and bringing a sinner from death to life. Our God has invited us to see the miracle, to be part of the miracle. But not in our work, but the Spirit's work through us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I think this gives us quite a bit of comfort as we know that it is not our works. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. See, we are not called to make people Christians. We are not called to change the heart of people. We're not called to change the lives of people. We are called to share that good news message with them. To sow the seed of salvation with them. To plant the word of Christ in their lives. At the end of the service today, I'd mentioned that I'm going to show you a video. This is a video that Lutheran Hour Ministries puts out. And they give several statistics right in a row. But there's one that, that really caught me off guard. And that statistic is that 50% of churches only, 50% of churches in the last year have seen a person come to Christ. 50% of churches in the U.S. have seen somebody go from death to life. That's a low number, isn't it? That's halfway. That means only half of our churches are bringing people into the message of salvation. And that means that there are a lot of people who will answer yes when we ask the question, haven't you heard? There are a lot of people who will answer the question, yes. And I need to hear. Because sin is very real. Even if they don't call it sin, Evil is very real in our, worry to, in our world today. And it wears you down. It tears you apart. And these people are very much in touch with it. They felt it. They've experienced it. They've seen it firsthand. And so they need to see the love of, of our God, our Savior, who loved us so much that before the foundation of the world, He had a plan for our salvation. It was no last-minute dealing, but it was a plan before we ever knew how much we needed Him to save us. And that is available not only for us, but for all people. So we ask with Isaiah, haven't you heard? Do you not know that there is a Savior? There is salvation, and it is yours. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know that there are many people in our world today who do not know You. There are many people who have not heard the message of Your salvation. There are many people who have not known Your Gospel firsthand. And we pray that You would use us, that You would use missionaries, that You would use technology, that You would use whatever means possible to bring these people into Your fold that You would speak to their hearts and speak to their lives, and that You would change them. Change them from that death to life. Change them from that dying, evil person to a son or a daughter. Lord, may You lead us in whatever ways You have in mind to share that Gospel message, to preach it, to teach it, to bring it to the those who have not heard. And Lord, may we know that we are not alone, but surely you are with us to the very end of the age. Amen.